Have you ever felt butterflies in your stomach, done a nervous poop, or made a gut decision? These are all great examples of how your brain and your gut communicate with each other, known as the gut-brain axis. Your gut microbiome is one of the most dense microbial ecosystems on Earth. These microbes may be small, but there's a lot of them. And they have a big say on what you do, how you behave, what you want to eat, and even your mood. Nice excuse. So what can we do to make this gut-brain connection work for us, not against us? I'm Dr. Curran, an NHS surgeon, and in this podcast, we cut through the BS of modern health advice and tackle the biggest issues in science and medicine. Today, I'm joined by Professor Jonathan Swan from the University of Southampton, one of the world's leading experts on the gut-brain connection and all things microbiome. Together, we discuss why problems with your gut may cause IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, depression, and even Alzheimer's, as well as just how bad antibiotics are for your gut health whether gut-brain therapies like psychobiotics are any good or will be any good, why meditating monks have super healthy guts, and surprising news about human trials of poop transplants. Enjoy. Jonathan, so brilliant to have you on today. And I'm really excited by this conversation, mainly because I feel that gut health has now breached that barrier and it's in the main public eye. And it's a buzzword when people talk about probiotics and gut health. But an area of gut health, which is greatly underappreciated, and certainly there's a growing understanding of, is the link between the gut and other parts of the body. And one thing which is very interesting, and you know, I guess in its nascency of our understanding, is the gut-brain connection, how the intestines and everything to do with the gut health and the microbes which live inside us have a role to play in influencing our brain. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yes, certainly. So, yeah, in the last, I guess, two decades, really, there's been this explosion of research into what we call the gut-brain axis. Everyone loves an axis. Um, so there's a, a gut brain, a gut liver, a, a gut muscle axis. But, yeah, we're particularly interested in the gut-brain axis. So in nature, there, there's been a lot of examples of, of the gut-brain axis. So, for example, certain fungi in the rainforests can infect ants and take over the central nervous system of ants and turn them into what, what's called zombie ants. It's the cordyceps. Yes, that's it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so there's a lot, lot of, um, uh, examples, uh, examples in nature of this. And, and so what we've started to, to really see is this link between the microbes or the microbiota and the brain and how they can influence things like behavior, um, mood, uh, cognition. Yeah, so a lot of the research coming out has been centered around mouse models initially. And so, um, seeing how that the, the microbes can influence, um, cognition has been, uh, uh, well illustrated. Um, things like, uh, depressive like behavior has been links, uh, with the microbiota there. And we're starting to see links with things like Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease as well. If you think about the evolution of humans and the fact that we've, essentially evolved over, you know, millions of years from single celled organisms. And we now are essentially a glorified housing unit of millions of microbes. And they've been around on this earth for longer than we have. And we are, you know, they're, they're just renting our space and our real estate. I guess you could argue that philosophical question, are we human or are we just a manifestation of these microbes? Because as you suggested, we, they influence so many things about us, from producing vitamins, nutrients, neurotransmitters, and even influencing the brain. And how exactly does that influence occur? Because these microbes, the bulk of them, although we have them all over our body, including our skin, they also mainly live in the colon and in the intestine. So what means do they have to communicate with other parts of the body, but specifically the brain? Yes, it's uh, something referred to as the holobiont theory of evolution, that the, the fitness of the host of us is not purely down to just our genome. It's actually down to our genome plus all the genomes of all these microorganisms that live in and on our bodies. We know that they can communicate, that the microbes can influence our brain through, through several mechanisms. One is that through the metabolites they produce. So they produce these in the gut and we know these can be absorbed from the gut and, um, can interact with our, our metabolism and can also reach our brain and interact with our metabolism in the brain. We can have immune interactions, uh, so they can trigger immune responses in the host. 
And so things like inflammation can happen, neuroinflammation that can impact on behavior. We know you have this, uh, what's called the vagus nerve, which connects the central nervous system with the enteric nervous system in the gut. And it's thought that through metabolites or through interactions of the microbes with that, that um, sort of nervous system, you can um, modify brain functions as well. And then there's also uh, endocrine effects. So it can affect things like cortisol release and stress responses. So really there's, I guess, three main routes in which they connect via the vagus nerve, that information highway, metabolites they produce, and you know the immune system as well via that inflammatory uh, response route as well. Is it fair to say that that relationship the gut has with the brain is a bidirectional relationship? So the gut talks to the brain, but the brain can also talk to the gut and cause problems and maybe even provide benefits the other way. Yeah, absolutely. There's your classic examples that when people get nervous, um, they might have what we call butterflies in your stomach. Uh, so a prime example of your brain influencing in your gut processes, which can have an impact on, on your microbes and the types of microbes that are there. Um, can also influence things like uh, transit time through the gut, which again can influence what the bugs are doing, what they're producing, which can then have that bidirectional influence back on the brain. So how many microbes are in the gut, like how many different species of bacteria and different organisms, and how many of them have we mapped out in totality? Yeah, again, that's a, that's a great question. And it, it gets kind of revised up and down all the time. So the current estimate is, I think in its current format, it's about 37 trillion microorganisms wow. um, in and on our body. So you have a, a skin microbiome, as well as a gut microbiome, as well as a lung microbiome. And the best study, those really are the bacteria. Uh, and so they, they are well mapped out in terms of what we call, we use something called metagenomics to study all the genomes of all these, uh, these microorganisms, mainly, mainly the bacteria. And those genomes contain lots and lots of genes. And so different bacteria bring with them different genomes, which have different genes. And if we think about all of that genetic information together, so in your gut, you have this, what we refer to as the metagenome, all of these trillions of genomes. Uh, it's been estimated there's around 3 million different microbial genes in that metagenome. And so when you compare that to your human genome, which is around 24,000 genes, you've got somewhere of about 100 to 150 times more genetic information in your metagenome than your human genome and kind of many of those genes will um, encode proteins or enzymes that will perform metabolic functions and so we really start to see that the the microbes have this this huge contribution to to host uh, metabolism so when we're looking at different people and we're looking at their dna obviously you know everyone has you know differing dna and that provides some genetic diversity in the population but then if you look at that metagenome that genome library of the bacteria and microorganisms living within them that's even more another another layer of diversity which i guess can further diversify people's phenotype and genotype and then give those I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, depending on the makeup of their metagenome, their microbiome um, genetic makeup, that can also influence a person's disease risk, cancer risk, you know, various degrees of immune risk and all sorts. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we think your, your genome is static when you're born. There's, there's the epigenome, but uh, the microbiome is, is adapting throughout the life course. So you, you kind of have this rapid colonization in early life, and then you have this transition to adolescent to adult like microbiome, and then you get a decline in, in older age. And yeah, that has this really strong influence on a whole range of phenotypes, as we heard about behaviors, but can also shape how you might respond to certain nutrients, how well you process food, and also drugs. There's there's a lot of um, data showing how your microbiome modifies how you might respond to different, usually orally administered drugs, but can be the other drugs as well. And so variation across the population in, in microbiomes can have that additional consequence for variation in, in drug responses. I think one of my favorite stories, and I guess almost the origin story of the gut-brain axis was you know, in the sort of late 19th century, the army surgeon, Sir William Beaumont, when he was using uh, Alexis St. Martin, this soldier who'd received this massive wound in his stomach, which didn't heal, he used that 
open wound as a window to digestion. And he would feed small morsels of meat or bread, and he'd put it into this open wound in the stomach. And depending on the mood of his patient, so if he was angry, frustrated, or upset, he could see varying degrees of digestive rates. So if he was upset, the digestive rate would be slower, and the food would take longer to digest. If he was happy, it would be accelerated. And I guess that was our first inkling that there is this gut-brain connection and how our emotions and brain can influence the digestive processes. And now, I mean, going forward to that and our increasing appreciation of that, the sort of that link between the gut and brain where it breaks down is where I guess in the clinical setting is I see some patients with irritable bowel syndrome that are it's classified as a gut brain disorder, other functional problems, maybe some types of constipation where there is some disconnect between the gut and brain leading to all of this. Now, you mentioned earlier that we've got the enteric nervous system, that second brain which lives in our gut, which is also communicating with the central nervous system in our head. What is the real problem when there's that disconnect between the gut and brain and how does that disconnect occur? How does that sort of plug pull itself apart? Yeah, a lot of the the research into this is still in those kind of initial stages. And it's sort of one of the the challenges really is that everyone has this unique microbiome. So actually defining normality is really tricky um, because you know everyone has this different microbial state. So actually knowing what your microbiome should look like is really difficult. And so then it's difficult to understand what's departure from normality. And so there's, there's a lot of connections with, with IBS, IBD, and it's thought that there's, there's probably an underlying genetic susceptibility that then relies on this environmental trigger. And, and this is where we see a lot of the times that the microbiome is different between people with IBS and those without. And, and then it's thought that it's this, this adverse immune reaction to the microbes that are possibly linked to those, um, genetic susceptibility. But then you, because of that bi-directional relationship where stress, um, inflammation can also change the microbiome, it's something that we really grapple with or really struggle to, to, to understand in science is, is that causality. Are the microbes different because of IBS, IBD, or are they driving the IBS and IBD? And, and this is where, um, you have rodent models come in or, or large human studies to try and unpick that and understand it and we're, we're getting there but there's yeah it's very complicated so, so it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation where you don't know what's the cause and what's the effect and i guess that relates to another early example from 1910 there's a doctor called george porter phillips and he's worked at the royal bethlehem hospital and um he had i think he did a study and i mean this is a very small study you know, hundreds of years, hundred years ago, where he had eighteen patients with melancholia, depression, um, in those days, and he gave them all uh, fermented milk products, kefir, and eleven of them were cured of their symptoms of depression and constipation, and two of them had greatly improved symptoms. And then that's when, again, there was a suggestion that there was a link between the gut and brain because all of these 18 patients with depression had severe constipation as well. And giving them kefir, which contains lactobacillus bacteria, which is thought of as a good bacteria, maybe you can hypothesize that improve the diversity and environment of the gut flora, which then impacted the mood. Now, how far can we say that improving your gut environment can have these positive impacts on the mood because clearly there will be some causes of depression and mood disorders which are linked to extraneous world problems or financial problems but then there may be a subset of depressive conditions and mental health issues which might be directly linked to a dysbiotic or an abnormal gut yeah so probably the best way to to answer that is um, in an, in a unhealthy gut or with poor gut health. So you have these, these tight junctions. So between your gut cells that, that line the gut, you have these, these tight junctions and they, they block a lot of things that move from the gut into the, the circulation. Um, and so those tight junction proteins and often with dysbiosis, um, you can, you can get a, a damaging or a, a weakening of those junctions and it allows 
things, nutrients or parts of bacteria to move between the cells to, to what we call translocate from the gut into the circulation. And they can have be quite pro-inflammatory. So things like LPS or lipopolysaccharide, and that can trigger inflammation. And it's been thought, I think it's actually been shown that um, LPS can, when it reaches the brain, can weaken those same barriers is what you have in the brain called the blood-brain barrier. It can also weaken those. And that can lead to neuroinflammation. And it's thought that that neuroinflammation results in, in the conversion of an amino acid called tryptophan into kynurenine. That's the body's response to try and dampen inflammation. But as a consequence, your, your body needs that tryptophan to make serotonin, which is needed to, to maintain mood. And so it's thought that neuroinflammation by, by using up that that tryptophan, what's called the tryptophan steel, it lowers the amount of serotonin in the brain and can lead to those depressive-like behavior. Uh, and so the reason why, kind of going back to the question, those, sort of, we'll call them probiotic bacteria, those beneficial bacteria, they can produce things like short-chain fatty acids, which have been shown to actually promote those tight junctions. They actually help to form that barrier in the gut and stop that movement of those bacterial fragments that can cause that inflammation into the circulation. I guess going on from that point that you made in this link between harmful byproducts or that cycle or that negative cycle of some of these bacteria providing that inflammatory environment, which is then, you know, being linked to neurodegeneration. I believe uh, in 2019, there was this Flemish study in Belgium of over a thousand participants, and they showed an association between depressive symptoms and a decreased number of fecali bacterium and coprococcus type of bacteria, which was also low, associated with a lower quality of life indicator score as well, which is an epidemiological study. Again, association doesn't mean causation necessarily, but certainly that suggests that there may be certain bacterial strains which may be linked to depressive symptoms or a lack of certain bacteria or a lack of diversity, which can also be linked with depression. Again, I guess it comes to that question is, does depression or a mental health disorder change our eating habits or lifestyles in a way that results in a lower diversity of bacteria? Or do these bacteria directly contribute to inflammation and depression and all of those anhedonic symptoms? Yes. Yeah, so the the source so i think in that that flemish study they actually linked as well those short chain fatty acids as well to um quality of life um type measures and and actually we know that those short chain fatty acids come from carbohydrate and fiber breakdown which has all been shown that that increased diversity increased short chain fatty acids all been associated with um more diverse and more healthful diets um, and actually, if you transition away from a, a high fiber to a low fiber diet, you actually start seeing more protein degradation by the microbiota and they produce more products associated with that protein breakdown, which tend to have more toxic effects. And they've been linked in with things like irritable behavior. So it kind of does show that importance of that diverse diet and that healthy diet in, yeah, in shaping the microbiome and shaping that, that behavioral effects. How, how much of a role do you think diet can play in mood? I mean, as you've just mentioned, having that higher fiber diet and diversity can help those bacteria. And then byproduct of that would be beneficial short chain fatty acids and decreasing inflammation. So do we have any real world evidence in terms of sort of longer term studies that certain diet types can be beneficial for mental health? Yeah, there's some data on the Mediterranean diet having beneficial effects. Uh, again, it's very difficult to unpick all those, those uh, connections. So if you're living a more healthy diet, I think, you know, it's been shown if, um, largely people suffering with major depressive disorder that, that will go to having a, a poorer diet. And so trying to unpick that from the microbial relationship between the microbes and the mood and the mood and the diet and the diet and the microbiota, it gets to be a very complex situation. But kind of going to the um, causality, and one of the things that really moved the field forwards is work by um, uh, John Crian's group over in University College Cork, where, again, this, this cause or effect, trying to understand is the microbes different because of the depression or are they driving the depression? And what they actually showed is that by taking the feces of depressed individuals, um, which contains 
it's often where we what we use to look at the microbes and transplanting those into rats um, they could show that you could actually transfer behaviors you, the the rats receiving the depressive like uh, feces actually exhibited more depressive like behavior than rats that received feces from non-depressed individuals so it showed you could actually transfer them via transfer in the microbiota so it it was starting to show that that causality is linked to the microbes. So I guess that transfer of that depressive microbiome from humans to rats showed how you could translocate those depressive symptoms as well. And I believe there was another group that replicated something similar with autism and ADHD in mice as well. Do we have any evidence of that fecal transplant, poo transplant from human to human. So trans, you know, translocating the depressive microbiome of one human to another who doesn't have depression and then them seeing those depressive symptoms and vice versa. Those studies are underway uh, and I, I think it's only a matter of time before we actually start seeing some, some outcomes from those. And yeah, it's a really interesting area. What we have to remember with fecal microbial transplants is their they're quite noisy. So people collect them. You are not only transplanting the bacteria, which is, which is really well studied, but you're also transplanting all the viruses or the fungi that are in the stools, the, um, the protozoa. You're transplanting those as well. And so actually trying to understand what it is that might be driving effects. You've also got the, the metabolites in that stool sample. Um, it's a whole mixture. And, and so there's real efforts now underway to try and provide um, simplified synthetic cultures um, to to see whether you can replicate the same kind of effects. And there's also some work underway to see, can you take a fecal transplant and actually irradiate it to kill all the, the living things in that stool sample? Do you still get a beneficial effect when, when it's not living? And then you've got a bit more control over transplanting potentially harmful things into the gut. I guess a lot of our discussion has revolved around those specific types of microbes, the bacteria, because we know a lot about them. Mm. But how big a role do we know that viruses, fungi, archaea play in disease incidence or disease reduction and just influencing the brain and all these other things that we've spoken about? What is the sort of research telling us at the moment or just do we not know enough? Yeah, traditionally, the approach used to study the microbiota is something called 16S. So you're studying a particular part of the genome, and that is very specific to bacteria. And so, so really, it's been a technical limitation that has prevented, because um, it's a lot more expensive to look at the full genome. And so that's what's restricted, really, looking at the viruses and the fungi. But now those costs are coming down, and people are looking at that a lot more. And we're actually starting to, there's a whole field of, of research looking at the bacteriophages, which are actually the viruses mm. that attack the bacteria that live in the gut. So it's thought that maybe it's the bacteria are these big microorganisms, if you like, that are producing the metabolites, but actually above them, you've got the, the puppet master, the, the viruses that are controlling the bacteria. Um, and there's, there's quite a bit of growing data now showing that viruses, bacteriophages are linked in with things like memory, things like depression. And so we're going to see more and more of that now that that technology is available. And the fungi as well, um, that is a growing area. There's some work going on looking at how fungi may be certain members of um, Saccharomyces, I think it is, are, are linked in with Alzheimer's disease. And um, there's also the whole area of psychedelics. And so the types yeah. of psychedelic compounds that might be in things like magic mushrooms, how they can have beneficial effects on mental health. And that's a, a growing field as well. I guess it makes sense because, you know, when someone has a flu and they're infected by a virus, their mindset and mentality and mental health can be affected with lethargy, low mood, driven by that inflammatory response. And we've also seen a mass real world example during COVID, a lot of people suffering with long COVID and the sort of, you know, post viral fatigue, brain fog, these can all be directly attributed to the effects of that long term dormant virus causing havoc in their central nervous system and beyond. Yeah, absolutely. And, and how much is linked to changes in the microbiome? I mean, we saw a lot with COVID that there were changes in the microbiome, changes in um, gut transporters, which again will have an effect on the microbiota. But then you've also got the whole inflammatory side as well, which is um, modifying all those things we discussed earlier. Now, 
something which you know commonly crops up is you know people say uh, i've got a gut feeling or i've got a gut instinct about something and it sounds like just you know a terminology someone might use but there seems to be some science behind it certainly as our understanding of the gut microbiome increases and we know that they can influence our mood our feelings and emotions they can have a role in influencing, for example, our food choices, um, our sort of impulsivity maybe as well. So when someone says they have a sort of a gut feeling, is that a sort of a correlate between the gut brain axis? Is that a direct result of that? Yes. Yes. So there is certainly an element of that. And, you know, there's been lots of data showing that your your microbes can influence appetite, which actually makes perfect sense. It, the, the microbes receive their nutrients from us. And so being able to control what we eat when we eat it makes perfect sense. Um, and actually, that's a really nice illustration of this co-evolution. We have to remember, um, as, you, as you mentioned earlier, that the microbes were here first and we've evolved in the presence of the microbes. And you see that with throughout our body, we have these receptors that um, that bind to signals from the microbes. So even in your brain, throughout your body, you have these receptors where microbial-based metabolites will interact with those receptors and that will turn on gene expression, a whole range of pathways. And so the microbes, yeah, they have this really wide-reaching influence over our, our peripheral system, not just in our gut and not just in our brain, but quite throughout our body. How big a role do you think gut brain therapies and things like psychobiotics so precision therapy targeted directly at that gut brain axis and the microbes in our gut how big a role do you think that sort of therapy could play in the future because as far as i'm aware right now the sort of only interaction i've had with therapies that focus on gut brain disorders would be things like prescribing patients who've got irritable bowel syndrome with antidepressants to limit the kind of on signals in the brain gut, which then can have effects on the actual brain and help to relieve some of those IBS type symptoms. But beyond that, prescribing specific prebiotics, the fuel for the bacteria, or probiotics, beneficial bacteria, for specific patients with gut brain disorders, that seems a little bit far ahead in the future. Uh, so wh where are we in terms of that? Yeah, there's a there's a lot of work going into to psychobiotics, probiotics, uh, and so we know that many many members of the microbes can produce neurotransmitters, so things like serotonin, GABA, dopamine, uh, and so one of the main areas of psychobiotic selection is which microbes can produce those, and. It's probably unlikely that the serotonin produced in the gut is actually going to make it all the way to the brain. But what we think happens is that one is that that serotonin can interact directly with the enteric nervous system and trigger responses that way. But also the balance of microbes um, and how much they use up precursors or produce precursors for those neurotransmitters. So a lot of, say, for example, serotonin comes from the uh, amino acid tryptophan. and if your microbes can produce tryptophan like the bifidobacteria can, then you can boost the amount that can reach the host, so the amount of bioavailable tryptophan for the host, and then that in turn will increase the circulating levels of tryptophan, which can increase the circulating and central levels of uh, serotonin. So that, that's one area. And that there's, there's some studies that ha have shown uh, beneficial effects of both pre and probiotics in, in depression and anxiety. But some other studies that have shown that they haven't been affected and there's some meta-analyses which have shown that overall there isn't that clear signal. But again, it goes back to this idea that we will have this very diverse, um, different in individual microbiota. And so it's, it's not going to be a one size fits all. And it's right now at that stage where we're trying to understand people with low mood. It seems that they will benefit from probiotics, but then perhaps the general population where there's not the low mood, then they wouldn't be as effective. So I guess we could say that for a broader generic population, providing probiotics, for example, is unlikely to you know, be a miracle cure or a panacea for all ills. But for specific populations, there could be a role of you know, probiotics as a targeted therapy for mental health conditions. Because obviously, you know, we know from the data that I think only two out of 10 people prescribed antidepressants see significant improvements in their mental health outcomes. And I guess 
you know, that leads me on to something like prebiotics and, you know, prebiotics, fiber rich foods and a specific t- subtype of fiber, which can modulate the microbiome. That is probably the most well researched in terms of pre, pro and postbiotics. And, you know, that's a, a dietary manipulating factor, which is under, you know, everyone's control, which maybe has, you know, the best secret to managing that gut brain axis and allowing it to flourish. Yes, uh, probiot- uh, sorry, prebiotics benefit from, they boost what's naturally in your gut already. So the probiotics are already resident in your gut. They can boost their levels. And often, yeah, their benefits are, are, are from the production of things like short chain fatty acids. Because an important point to, to note there is that I think it's about 60% of people with, um, major depressive disorder report, um, GI abnormalities, GI problems as well. And so, even if it's not improving mood, there's there's huge amounts of data that show that both pre and probiotics improve gut health. So whether that's improving tight junction proteins, whether it's reducing gut inflammation, whether it's um, out competing pathogenic bacteria, you know, there's there's those benefits of those pre and probiotics there. I guess you know, even though sometimes it's difficult for us to unpick the chicken and egg, whether the microbes cause mental health problems or brain problems or the brain then reducing the diversity of microbes, regardless, it looks like it's a negative feedback loop anyway. So if you've got a mental health condition and your gut is out of whack, if it continues to be out of whack, it's going to produce a pro-inflammatory environment, which seeps into the brain via the bloodstream. And then the brain is more stressed and more inflamed then talking back to the gut, worsening the inflammation. And you can see that negative feedback loop just going on and on. And probably there's no improvement of symptoms. So it doesn't, I guess, harm things to focus on gut health as an aspect of a treatment of depression. Not saying that gut health directly causes depression, but, you know, I guess historically we've thought of depression as, you know, a imbalance of serotonin or chemicals in the brain. And I think that does disservice to something like depression, which probably is a, you know, it's a very complex disorder and looking at these other lifestyle factors. And I guess gut health is a huge health pillar, which shouldn't be ignored when treating chronic conditions like depression. Yeah, absolutely. And as we talked about earlier, that, that, that loss of diet diversity as well with, with often with depression. So you're going to be losing the fiber from the diet quite often. And so, yeah, your pre- prebiotics are a way of, of reestablishing that and trying to break that cycle. How big a role do you think things like antibiotics can have on the gut brain axis and mental health? Because I came across a study of around 14,000 NHS nurses, and they saw an association between lower cognitive scores in memory and focus and learning when they looked at participants who'd had a long course of antibiotics at some point in their life, over two months worth of antibiotics was associated with lower cognitive scores, which I guess suggests that antibiotics can lower diversity and the abundance of good bacteria, which then can impact the brain. Yeah, the yeah antibiotics have this, uh, obviously depending on the type of antibiotics, but yeah, they can really suppress the microbes and how the gut recolonizes. It isn't necessarily going to recolonize exactly the way it was before. Some studies have shown it does rebound. Some studies show it doesn't. Some show, show that actually it might take months to, to fully recover. And in that period, you're getting those different signals, those different interactions with the microbes. Uh, and that's, again, going to have an impact on mental health, which could have an impact on dietary preferences, dietary um, impact on your microbiome. And again, you've got that cyclical um, relationship through time. I mean, a lot of the things we've spoken about revolve around inflammation and inflammation, I guess, is that sort of, you know, buzzword as well these days where people think it's bad, but, you know, it's neither good nor bad. We need a degree of inflammation to do good things, but also in excess, it could be bad as we've seen in gut conditions and even brain conditions. Now, when it comes to a lot of chronic diseases, inflammation seems to be a common denominator as a sort of hallmark symptom, whether it's metabolic conditions, whether it's obesity, lung conditions, and even neurodegeneration and brain conditions like Alzheimer's, dementia, et cetera, and even Parkinson's. What do we know about that link between our microbiome and the propagation of these neurodegenerative conditions like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's? With Parkinson's disease, uh, it's been shown that um, 
individuals with Parkinson's disease have higher levels of certain types of E. coli. And it's thought that those E. coli produce um, an enzyme, uh, sorry, a protein called curly, which has been associated with the, the condition. And whether that's a target that could be addressed through um, pre and probiotics, through targeted antimicrobials, maybe even. Um, and then uh, Alzheimer's disease, again, um, I think it's about half people with Alzheimer's disease report that through life they've suffered with bouts of constipation. Um, kind of linking is there this historic link between the altered gut health and and the onset of Alzheimer's? And is there a way it's been shown, for example, you can transplant the feces of individuals with Alzheimer's into mice uh, and you can see that actually that that development of the, the mechanisms that underpin Alzheimer's are enriched in those mice. So um, to do with your the amyloid uh, accumulation. And so then that starts to raise questions. Can you use pre and probiotics to try to suppress or delay the onset of Alzheimer's uh, or Parkinson's? Do we have any data suggest that um, dietary changes like increasing prebiotic consumption, probiotic consumption can help to slow down the disease process in those conditions? Because obviously, if you look at uh, dementia and Alzheimer's, we're really stuck when it comes to treatment for it. And even the newer drugs which have come out into the market, like lecanemab, they haven't been as effective as hoped for, and they only really work for the mild early cases. Yeah, it's... It's a really difficult, because it's over such long extended periods of time, it's a really difficult, um, certainly in humans, to, to explore. We're looking at this right now in, in fly models to, uh, of Alzheimer's to see whether we can give pre and probiotics to delay um, or to prevent the accumulation of, of plaques, which are associated with the Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and so we're, we're looking at that currently. What, what about, I mean, because you're working a lot on age-related cognitive, uh, you know, impairment and things like that. What's really sort of exciting you in that sort of field at the moment? Yeah, I mean, some of the, the signals we're seeing are related to things like bile acids. So we know that bile acids are the, these class of molecules that are synthesized in your liver from cholesterol. And they're, they're, they're conjugated in the liver and they're, they're put into your intestine where they help to break down fats and help to absorb the fats. But we also know that the the microbes can modify them into what we call secondary bile acids, which are then reabsorbed and returned to the liver. And so you get this, this shuttling of bile acids between the liver and the microbiota. And we now know that it's not just lipid digestion that those bile acids are important for. They can also bind to these receptors throughout the body, which are a bit like lock and key. And the, the bile acids are the, the key and they go into these locks. And as they go into the locks, they modify gene expression. And that relates to things like energy metabolism, lipid metabolism, sugar, glucose metabolism. But it's also been shown that they can have a link with mood, with neurotransmission, uh, with memory as well. It means shown that they can reach the brain. And so the types of microbes you have in your gut has a strong influence on the types of bile acids that flow through this system. And different bile acids have different potencies for how much they activate these, these receptors. And what we're seeing is some of these bile acids seem to be associated with cognitive decline, impaired memory formation, um, or, or sort of yet yeah, decline in, in cognition. And so then it starts to give you a target. Can you modify directly the bile acids? So statins can have an impact there. Or can you modify the bacteria to modify how they produce different bile acids? And so that's, that's something we're really exploring right now. In terms of I guess, management strategies, which people could apply at home to somehow, you know, mitigate the negative effects of the gut brain axis and dysbiosis and these gut microbes causing havoc in all of these linked to chronic conditions. I came across something interesting where I guess, again, it's a very limited study, but, um, you know, I think they, they analyzed the microbiome of 37 uh, you know tibetan monks and they found that compared to 19 local residents that there was a increased amount of gut diversity in these tibetan monks which suggests that they have a better gut profile and again going extrapolating that further suggesting that these benefits and the increased diversity of the gut microbiome which we know is good was delivered by mindfulness and meditation how big a role do you think that stress management and even meditation can have on the environment of the gut? 
Yeah, I think everyone uh, can can relate to that. If if you have um, periods of stress, you you have that disrupted gut balance. I think everybody's probably experienced that at some point in their lives, uh, which is gonna have this shaping, especially if it's chronic. If it's over long periods of time, it's gonna have that chronic that shaping of the microbiota, which then is gonna feed back on those those mood signals. Um, yeah, it's really interesting, really interesting. So on the, on the diversity point of view. Generally speaking, diversity is good because, as we mentioned earlier, although that genetic information that's contained in your in your microbiome, if you've got a very diverse microbiome, you have a lot of functional redundancy. So even if you lose one bacteria, the things it was doing is still present amongst all the others. So it's not going to affect you. You're going to have that quite stable, quite resilient microbiome. And that's really why that diversity is really good. And you mentioned before, obviously, in addition to diversity, increasing the fiber consumption is there anything else you think that has like you know low-hanging fruits that people could use to just improve their gut microbiome so it does flourish and sort of help them long term and reduce the burden of chronic diseases yeah the i think the current uh phrase is to eat the rainbow <laughs> so mm. if you can eat a, a diet with lots of different colors um, that tends to be a, a very nice balanced diet full of um, what we call polyphenols, which are uh, chemicals found in, in foods, which are often have these, these beneficial effects. And it's what they might even act as, or they often do act as a, a prebiotic for for microbes. Microbes like to break down these these compounds, and it boosts the growth of of those particular types of bacteria. And they've been associated with lots of beneficial effects as well. Um, so yeah, so polyphenols, a very diverse diet and yeah, lots and lots of fiber. They're the, the easy wins, if you like. Do you think there's any role to play in dietary strategies like intermittent fasting? Because I guess there's equivocal evidence of prolonged periods of fasting and what it does to the gut microbiome. Because from a mechanistic point of view, you know, having a few hours without eating, for example, allows your the existing gut microbes to scavenge any cell debris and other contaminants from the gut lining and essentially auto-digest and do a cleanup job, essentially, which might reset the gut microbiome and improve the gut profile in some way. But then there's also some evidence that prolonged periods of fasting beyond several hours could have a negative influence and actually decrease diversity in the gut microbiome yeah there's there's some studies already in intermittent fasting and i think we're going to see more and more um yeah I, again i think it's probably a bit of both i think there is some some level of uh yeah cleanup if you like but then you are going to lose certain microbes that might be reliant particularly i mean one area we're starting to understand more and more about is the small intestinal microbiome and the, the reason why we we've been limited in the past is that we mainly studied stool samples. And so that's telling us information about the colon and, and for its own reasons, mainly because the colon has a much higher number of microbes present than the small intestine, but the small intestine is a really important site of absorption. And so we think that actually that small intestinal microbiota is going to be important, even though from a numbers point of view, it's a lot less, but things like, uh, smart pills, which you can take and it samples specific parts of your gut improvements and that sort of technology means we're, we're going to start studying the small intestine a lot more. And then we're probably going to find out a whole range of, of new exciting areas. You know, over the over the last few months, I've had a lot of patients who've had bowel surgery to remove the entirety of their colon ask me, because I don't have a colon anymore, do I need to worry about my fiber intake? And actually, do I even have a gut microbiome anymore? Because as you said, the colon is where the bulk of those microbes are housed. But then it makes me think about physiologically what happens when someone has their entire colon removed. And there's actually some adaptation of that small intestine where it starts to behave more like a colon. It starts to improve its capacity to absorb water. Even the lining of it changes somewhat to mirror the colon because the body always likes to adapt. And I guess there may be also some increased growth of certain types of colonic bacteria, which may migrate and start to live and, you know, reproduce in the small intestine. So I guess there's like a neo gut microbiome, which could develop in that small intestine for those patients who have lost their colon. 
I guess I also wanted to ask you because a lot of the testing that's done looking at the microbiome is based on stool samples. Now, the stool samples we collect, and if we look at the microbiome and the bacteria in the stool samples, that is something which is being ejected from the colon, which suggests that actually they have not colonized. So is it a less than adequate marker of what's going on in the colon if it's actually stuff that's being ejected, suggesting it's not actually you know, being fixed and colonizing the colon? And does that then, that begs the question, how effective are these at-home stool tests which attempt to diagnose someone or look at their microbiome? It suggests that maybe it's probably not a very, you know, strong or accurate test. Yeah, it, it comes down to uh, accuracy versus what's practical, I think, really. Um, a lot of the initial work compared the fecal samples uh, to road traffic accident victims so actually looked in the guts of those individuals and compared the profiles to the stool samples and showed there was some degree of of resemblance there was some sort of commonality between them so it is it is reflective of the colon but probably the more distal parts of the colon um, rather than the more proximal parts and certainly not the um, small intestine and i think that's where as we see more and more time progress um these ideas of these smart pills is probably gonna take over at the minute they're quite expensive uh and so unlikely to be sort of involved in these home collection kits but i, I can see that's the way the field is probably going to go yeah no I, I think this whole space of the gut brain axis is incredibly interesting and it will continue to have really important impacts on our everyday lives as we continue to understand it. And I really want to thank you for your time today and uh, yeah, all of your fantastic insights. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Oh, thank you for having me. Thanks again to Professor Jonathan Swan. What's the first thing you'll be trying out to improve your gut brain connection? An extra bit of fiber or maybe some meditation? Let me know in the comments. Subscribe so you don't miss the weekly Dr. Current Explodes podcast and I'll see you sentient bags of microbes next week.